Sabine. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, in the room here with us and also participants on Zoom. So we're very happy to welcome you to uh, the special talk today um, by Professor Peter da Costa. Um, so um, let me introduce, we're very happy to have Peter with us. Um, Peter is full professor in the Department of Linguistics, Languages and Cultures at Michigan State University in the US. And within this department, he also directs the Master of Arts in TESOL. Um, and he's part of the core faculty within the Second Language Studies PhD program. Um, Peter is originally from Singapore, so he's returning to his uh, home region um, by, by the, through this visit. Um, and he got undergraduate degrees from there. He also has a master's degree from Harvard and a PhD from the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, he's worked at Michigan State University since 2013 and was very recently promoted to full professor, for which we congratulate him. Yeah, um, He has, um, not understatement to say, a very large body of work, um, um, let's say covering really holistically the whole scope of applied linguistics. Um, the primary area, as he says, is identity, ideology, and emotion. But he's also done research on world Englishes, content language integrated learning, English medium instruction, um, critical classroom discourse analysis, language policy, and research ethics. I'll just give a couple of highlights of recent work. Um, there's um, work about identity and symbolic of power of language in the ELT classroom. Um, this is in context of English as lingua franca, in the Journal of English as a lingua franca. He's written on colonial narratives of ethics and research in research methods in applied linguistics. He's written on teacher emotions and language policy and system. And he's also uh, co-edited issues on uh, special issues of the RELC journal um, on English as medium instruction and also of multilingua um, on multilingualism, language education and linguistic entrepreneurship. Um, aside from all of this, Peter is also uh, the incoming president of the American Association of Applied Linguistics, um, which is uh, a rather big thing, yeah? Um, so we are incredibly honored to have him with us, and we're incredibly honored that um, he'll be presenting this talk to us and our many online participants um, from um, many different countries, yeah? i just like to, before I ask Peter to start, to outline um, how this is going to work. So Peter will talk for about 40 minutes to an hour, up, up or down, yeah? Um, if you get any, if you have, if you're on Zoom and you have any thoughts um, during, the, during the talk, um, you're very welcome to write questions in the chat. Um, we'll also have a spoken Q&A after the talk through Zoom and also with our participants in the room, yeah? So everyone will get uh, their chance to, to ask a question or make a comment, okay? Um, while you are on Zoom, um, if, you, if you could please watch out not to unmute yourselves. Um, it shouldn't be possible, but if it is, just to... Um, just to accommodate everyone else so that there's no uh, interruption in, inter in um, interruptions of sound. Mm -hmm. um, with that, I'd like to ask Peter da Costa to talk to us about um, critical multilingual language awareness. Um, so he's going to explain how we can move from pedagogical stance to research-based practices. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Christoph. I see an echo, I hear an echo, so I'm guessing that Zoom is also picking up on the audio as well. Thank you for the invitation to, to come here to Prince of Songkhla University. Thanks to the people in the room for being here. And thank you, everyone um, who's on Zoom. I see numbers increasing and people waiting to get into uh, the Zoom room as well. Um, uh, Christoph will be monitoring the chat. So as he mentioned earlier, if you have questions, um, please type in your questions and we'll definitely have time for Q&A later. 
So I'm really glad to be here. As Christoph mentioned, I'm originally from Singapore. And in fact, uh, this is a talk that I'll be doing next week at the RELC conference in Singapore. Um, so uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for, for the opportunity uh, to, to move um, forward here. I'm just going to see if I can advance the slides. Oops, I'm not moving right now. Um, okay. Let me see. Yeah. You know, <laughs> let, let me try. Small technical glitch. We'll sort this out. Yeah. But in the meantime, I'll just give you a little bit of background to the talk. Um, the talk will be based on a special issue of language awareness that I guest co-edited with my colleague from Michigan State, uh, Kun Van Gom. It came out on December 31st, 2023, just in time to close out the 23 uh, calendar year. And I'll be giving examples from all around the world, and that's why you have the second part of the title, uh, looking at research-based practices. Um, but I will first start with, uh, with a background to CMLA. That's the acronym I'm going to use, Critical Multilingual Language Awareness. And then I'll say a little bit more of what this pedagogical stance is. Uh, and, and, I, and I'll subsequently draw on examples from around the world to give you an idea of what CMLA might look like in different parts of the world. Are you okay here? Yeah? Yes. Ah, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think we are all good to go right now. So this is kind of the, the, the overview, and I, I've started to talk about that uh, in the last few minutes. I'm going to skip this. Um, uh, there's a lot of interest in the last few years on how do we bridge the researcher-practitioner divide. And I'm not exactly sure who's in the audience today, but I'm pretty sure that all of you at some point have been language teachers and that most of you are interested in being language researchers. So increasingly over the last few years, in the education world, we've been talking about it for a while, but in applied linguistics, uh, this has become, become quite a hot topic. Um, two years ago, my colleagues, Masatoshi Sato and Sean Lowen, uh, guest edited a special issue of the Modern Language Journal that looked at how do we bridge the research and practitioner divide. And my students, um, so our co-authors two, three, and four here, and I uh, were fortunate to be able to contribute to that special issue. So I, I direct you to that issue there. And that's kind of how I want to frame the session in that sense. I'm going to assume again that many of you are practitioners as well and that you continue to work with uh, language learners. So let me give you a little bit about a, a, a bit of history of, uh, to CMLA. I'm going to take you step by step, right? So this is what we're working towards, critical language awareness. But I'm going to unpack each of these terms for you and with you. All right, so I'm not going to talk too much about how English language instruction has evolved over the last century and a half. But if you see here, we started with grammar translation uh, in the 19th century before moving on to the audiolingual method, oh, sorry, to intensive reading, direct instruction in the 40s and 50s, uh, ALM or the audiolingual method in the 50s and 60s. And for, for the greater part of the last 50 years, CLT or communicative language teaching is where most of us have been trained. That's certainly uh, in the area that I was trained when I started my career as a teacher in 1996, coming up to about 30 years ago. All right. Uh, the fact is, across all four approaches that I've just mentioned, uh, language has kind of always been the object of instruction uh, and been treated as such. Unfortunately, so that's been foregrounded, and what's been backgrounded uh, has been the experiences of teachers and their students. So uh, the bulk of my talk will essentially cover uh, the need to center the li lived experiences of the teacher and the learner, all right? So that's kind of setting the tone uh, for the talk today. But in order for this to happen, we do need to reconceptualize language, moving from a skills perspective to a discourse perspective. Now, let me be clear. I, I completely believe in the importance of teaching skills, like speaking, listening, reading, writing. Those, that's the bread and butter of uh, instruction. 
uh, we we cannot run away from this crucial building blocks. At the same time, we need to develop a larger perspective, uh, that of a discourse perspective, right? One that takes into account social semiotics, negotiated meaning, ideologies and identities. And as Christoph mentioned in his introduction, I, I do work primarily in the area of identity, ideology, and emotions. So that was the language part of it, right? Let's move one step up, language awareness. Uh, and this is not a new area. It's been around again for the greater part of 40 years. You see two books uh, represented here by Hawkins and Melitho and Tomlinson. And uh, the primary focus of uh, colleagues who've worked on language awareness has been to increase knowledge about language itself. And awareness, by and large, refers to having students notice uh, linguistic nuance. Uh, this is my former colleague, the late Leo Van Leo. So there seems to be like a University of Lancaster, Lancaster University thing going on here. He got his PhD from Lancaster. Uh, his uh, advisor, I, I believe that time, was the late Christopher Candlin. And then Leo was my colleague at, um, in California at the Monterey Institute of International Studies. So in 1990s, 95, he put out the book that you see at the bottom right, Introducing Language Awareness. And as you know, there's also an association for language awareness. In fact, I'm going to the conference in July um, in, in Germany, uh, uh, which will focus on language awareness. But more importantly, I want to point out what Van Leer said, right? He said, language is important, but somehow we often go through life being unaware of language. And he goes on to say that language awareness can be defined as an understanding of the human faculty of language and its role in thinking, learning, and social life. So basically, it kind of covers almost every fundamental aspect of our lives, right? So thinking, learning, and social life. And, and um, again, for those of uh, us who work from uh, a language awareness perspective, one of the things that we seek to do is to challenge linguistic prejudice and parochialism in that sense. And we do this through engaging in open discussion, uh, among other things. So how exactly can language awareness help uh, the teacher who works in the language classroom? So one way to do this is to help students change their pronunciation. Uh, the teacher might want to make videos, for example, um, on how to help students notice and change their use of language. Perhaps the goal is to help their students emulate a preferred model of language use. So an example you can see here, I'm not going to play the example for you, is this teacher by the name of uh, Rachel, right? She's quite a fan base, 6.1 million view views, okay? And, you know, she's created instructional videos on how to speak like the so-called native speaker. And now that's a different topic of discussion today, but the fact is uh, it exists, right? And it, we just need to figure out that it, it all connects with and connects to language awareness in, in that sense. Now, friends, some of you might be familiar, and I think the younger ones among you might, might not be as familiar, but um, I know France has had a huge role in China, right, uh, in terms of helping uh, English language learners uh, acquire English uh, in, in that sense. And France, uh, the popular American sitcom from the 1990s to the mid-2000s, uh, did play a very informal role in helping with accent modification because um, people watching the what, 10 seasons of Friends, uh, suddenly found themselves very much interested in the lives of these six young um, uh, New Yorkers in that sense. But more specifically in relation to sociolinguistics, this is the late Jan Blumacht, right? In about 2009, he published this article in Language Policy that he titled A Market of Accents. And this research was based on people who work at call centers so, for example, in the U.S., when I need technical assistance, I call uh, a, a specific number and I get someone in the Philippines or in India. And those individuals are, of course, being trained to sound as American 
uh, as possible because that's the client base in that sense. Uh, again, a whole area for discussion in, in that sense. But what, we have, what we have, of course, is a commodification of dialectology, among other things that Plumat talks about. So then that leads, of course, to the idea of language policing, right? So um, the, the question is, how do we manage language? How do we police the, the use of uh, language of ourselves and perhaps of those around us, uh, including our students? My question then to you, um, the teachers in this audience, is to what extent do we use, or do we police language as teachers and um, the next question we should ask ourselves is, in what ways do your own language, identity, and ideology shape your pedagogy in that respect? Because we all make choices. And the choices we make ultimately impact our students and ourselves, of course. So that's the language awareness part of CMLA that I'm going to be talking about. And so we now move on to critical language awareness. Um, back to Leo Van Lea, I, I want to reread the first group here he talked about, as you see in the top part of the slide. Um, but I do want to, to emphasize the bottom box here when he says that awareness of power and control through language is a big part of language awareness. And we need to think about the intricate relationships between language and culture. So as language teachers, we know we're not just teaching language, right? Inev inevitably, we're also teaching culture. It's hard to decouple language from culture in, in, in that respect. Um, uh, this is a group of British uh, uh, applied linguists. Uh, at least two of them are from Lancaster as well. Just seem to be the place to be in the 1990s and early 2000s. Okay, uh, and they, they, uh, they uh, Remy Clark, Norman Thacklow, Ross Ivanich, and Marilyn Martin Jones proposed the idea of critical language awareness in order to shift our pedagogical and research focus. So here are some exemplar books that they put out, you know, 30 years or so ago. Okay. Um, essentially, what they were calling for was a shift from language awareness uh, toward critical language awareness. And so if you look at the right side of the table, CLA then focuses on issues such as social emancipation, uh, a critique and change of social and sociolinguistic order. Um, where we're now concerned with not so much fitting our children to social order, but fitting our children to work in and change social order, to be about uh, change and to be agents of change. And so from a CLA perspective, of course, uh, we, we, we will need to take into account that, you know, language is a social construct. Language evolves over time, right? And, and so things over time get normalized in that sense. And that's where, of course, the ideological aspects of language need to be considered as well. And finally, from the perspective of learning, uh, we need to take into account how knowledge is deeply intertwined with practice. So you can see, well, again, a shift from language awareness uh, to like, critical language awareness. Ultimately, that makes us think about how do we construct learners and teachers, and we really should be seeing them as being transformative uh, intellectuals. I move now into the area of language ideology. I've been talking about language ideology kind of tangentially so far. Um, and this has been the focus of a lot of people who work in linguistic anthropology. Uh, Jan Blomat, certainly one of them, uh, whose work I mentioned earlier. The late Michael Silverstein, who described language ideology as a set of beliefs about language. Um, and then Paul Crosscriti going on to say that language ideologies often indexed the political and economic interests of individual speakers. Now, those pe speakers tend to be individuals who constitute the dominant group in society. And so the, their ideologies, in a way, then kind of get imposed upon others in society. Right. And so I'm going to give you an example from Singapore. As I mentioned earlier, I'm from Singapore. And when we talk about CLA, critical language awareness, we do need to pay attention to language ideologies. Um, you might not be familiar with this, but we've had a 
speak good English movement in Singapore for over three decades now. All right. Uh, and so if you look at the picture, you can see a fair bit of correction going on, right? They cancel out what they deem to be the wrong version and then they replace it with what is supposed or supposed to be the correct version of saying things. Okay. Not off the light, but switch or turn off the light, right? There's a lot of ellipsis in English, uh, if you probably know. And so what we need to think about is what value systems are being uh, enacted and reproduced um, as a result of the language ideological work that's going on. So this is a poster flyer uh, as part of the Speak Good English movement. You will see that it's a very slick uh, poster. It's, uh, and the sponsors of this movement happen to be the Straits Times, which is the, the main English newspaper in Singapore, and the Ministry of Education. So this is a movement to identify uh, good English teachers, right? I love my English teacher. Let's nominate your English teacher to see that they might be able to be a winner of this award. Uh, you can't see the word hearts there, which are bullet points. So I've blown them up for you on the right. And so the, they're, they're looking specifically for teachers who, number one, exemplify the use of good spoken and written English, uh, among other things. But then the question, of course, we need to ask, what exactly constitutes good spoken and written English? And relatedly, who gets to decide what is good and spoken English? And therefore, those individuals ultimately play a language gatekeeping role in that respect. Right? Who are then the arbiters of these policies in that sense? Now, that, all this is very abstract, I understand. So now, if you're a teacher and you want to kind of work with critical language awareness in your classroom, one of the things you could possibly do is to design an assignment for your students where you ask them, among other things, to examine the language used in various forms. It could be in the Thai media, the Chinese media, the English media, and to have them think about the language ideologies that are embedded in these uh, uh, use of language in, in the media. So, I've been talking about language ideology and I've kind of been intimating or hinting at this idea of a standard language India, a language ideology, right? So, so there, there are many languages, there are different varieties of language, but somehow there seems to be this standard language, this mythical standard language that all of us should, should be aspiring towards, okay? So what happens is often is that and this is not only true of English, right? I just want to preface this. I'm using the example of English. It could be standard Thai. It could be standard uh, Mandarin Chinese. It just swap out the language with any other language in that respect. Um, but what happens is when we end up foregrounding uh, the standard language ideology, what ultimately happens is that we end up backgrounding multilingualism. So here's a, a, something to think about, that there are different types of bilingualism. Uh, this is an article there by Ophelia Garcia and, and Sylvan, and they have us think about the different types of bilingualism. Now, additive bilingualism seeks to add a new language to your linguistic repertoire. But subtractive bilingualism, you come in uh, with your first language, but then you're being taught your second language, and the goal then is to have your first language replaced by your second language. So that's subtractive in nature. Uh, this is quite true of the U.S. context, right? So you, you understand that in the U.S. there are, there are many immigrants who are coming from, say, Latin America, uh, from Africa as well, right? They, they, they're trying to seek... Um, immigration, uh, immigrant and refugee status in the country in, in that respect. So in, in the U.S. context, it's not unusual to find uh, multilingual, diverse learners um, in, in that respect. But they come to our classrooms, they come to our society, and then as a result of the existence of a monoglossic standard English language ideology, by the way, the U.S. doesn't have an official language, but somehow some people think it's English. Um, as a result of processes that uh, include, say, education, uh, you end up producing, or the goal is to end up producing students who are monolingual students, right? So think of it from that subtractive 
bilingualism perspective that I just talked about. So for example, if you come to the US with Spanish, the goal is to erase your Spanish and make you an English monolingual speaker. Same thing, not just picking on the US, many other countries do the same, right? Where they, they're trying to erase the L1 of, of, of learners. I'll come back to this idea of decolonizing multilingual pedagogies. But then again, um, perhaps a talk for a different day, and Christoph said that he might be convening a panel on translanguaging later this year. How do we see multilingualism, right? Are there multiple languages that exist side by side as separate languages? Or do we take a translanguaging perspective where we assume that people move very fluidly between one to even three languages in that sense. So we need to think about what kind of multilingual pedagogy are we promoting in schools and in what ways um, can we possibly decolonize that, that perspective. I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, but that's CLA for you. And finally, we move on to CMLA. Remember I said, the goal of this talk is to center the lived histories of uh, the teacher and the learner. This is an article that's published in the journal that I co-edited TESOL Quarterly about four years ago uh, by Prasad and Laurie. I'm going to give you a few minutes to look. There's a lot of information on this slide, all right? But I want to focus first on what's highlighted in yellow, right? This model of CMLA um, center, it, it puts power at the center. Can you see that in the picture, in the visual? Power is at the center and around it would be different dimensions like cognitive, affective, social, and performance. Um, when we look at power, what exactly does an emphasis on power mean, right? So one, one of the things is that you tend to emphasize the language speakers rather than the language itself. In keeping with what I've been talking about, where you uh, center the teacher and the learner. You recognize the histories of minoritized speakers and their struggles. So minoritized, you could be because you're from a uh, smaller uh, ethno-linguistic group. It could be because of your race. It could be because of your gender. It could be because of your sexuality. So minoritized is open to multiple forms of interpretation. Um, there's also a need to look at critical awareness of the social construction of language norms and standardization, what I've been talking about, right? Where you question, you problematize the embedded language ideologies. And finally, of course, we think about uh, the relations of power associated with languages, language learners, and the language users. Um, so when we center power, we're not ignoring the other important dimensions of language learning and teaching, right? We need to take into account into the affective aspects of language, the socio-emotional feelings that are associated with language. For example, you might feel a big sense of pride in revitalizing or maintaining your L1 in that sense. Or it could be a social part where your aspect of language where you want to understand and, and you want to embrace the intercultural aspects of language learning. In, in that respect. And we can't ignore the performance aspects of learning too, because we're all using language, right? Generally for interaction. And, and there's also a, certainly a cognitive di dimension to learning. Well, and, and you think about uh, reflecting on your language use and metacognition in that sense. So that's the model that, that, that they put out. And so this is kind of where I make this transition to, to saying that CMLA can be seen as a pedagogical stance, okay? Um, so in, what are some of the basic beliefs of CMLA that we can encourage teachers to embrace, right? For one thing, the teacher might have students reflect on their experiences of being excluded, uh, perhaps on the basis of their accent. Perhaps they come to school, they speak with a different accent. Uh, they might be made fun of in class. I mean, this is a big country, China is a big country, there's a huge rural-urban divide, right? So imagine if you come from the more rural provinces and you go into to schools in Beijing, for example, right? you seem to be seen as speaking for me. And your accent is not quite the standard Beijing accent in that sense. So we want to have teachers think uh, and have their students reflect on their experiences uh, on, on language use. 
And, and the main idea here is, of course, to have teachers take on or adopt an asset-based pedagogical approach. What does that mean, right? So asset versus deficit, right? So if I have an asset-based pedagogical approach, my perspective is that you come to my classroom with all these resources uh, from your home culture. Your home language is not seen as a bad thing that I want to remove or stamp out, right? It's something that I want to build on. So going back again, remember I talked about the additive approach to bilingualism, right? It's asset-based. You're building on. Deficit means you want to remove. And it's more of the subtractive bilingualism that I talked about earlier. So, so let's you do a little bit of um, visualization here, right? A quick metaphor. When you look at these three glasses in front here, uh, before you, what exactly does this stance look like, right? So um, I, I, I'm going to ask you, what do you notice in this picture and where is your attention directed? So if you look at just level one, your eye goes to the liquids in each of the glasses, okay? If you look one level up, maybe you, you, your, your attention might uh, steer towards the reflections that exist on the table. But in level three, you're taking in the entire visual, right? The entire composition, which includes, among other things, uh, the refraction of light too. So if you extend this metaphor to what a CMLA stance looks like, you know, at level one, you ask yourself what language needs to be taught. At level two, you push things a little further and, sit and have your students think about what are the hidden messages or values that are implicit in my teaching. And then level three, uh, you go on to think about the different aspects that I mentioned to you earlier, power, cognition, performance, affect, and social relations, and how these five dimensions combine to shape the language learning environments. Okay, so taking a big picture perspective, not just a microscopic view and looking at only one thing in that respect. And at all times, power is at the center, driving your uh, how you look at teaching. So um, same thing here, just a different uh, cast, casting or recasting of what I've just said. Uh, so, okay, I'm done with the, uh, the kind of the theoretical part right now. Um, so the, for the remainder of the talk, I'm just going to give you examples. Examples uh, from different parts of the world in terms of how exactly can we bridge this researcher-teacher divide and also how exactly do we enhance pedagogy uh, uh, when we are working with the students in our language classroom, okay? So I'll, I'll be giving you examples from a language teacher educator perspective, but I'll also be giving you examples from a teacher's perspective as well. So the examples I'm going to draw on uh, um, come from, as I mentioned earlier, a special issue of this journal, Language Awareness, that I guest edited with my colleague, uh, Kun Van Gogh. Um, this is the uh, introduction to the special issue, and so I encourage you to look at it if you're interested in, in finding out more about uh, the special issue. But more importantly, uh, we're very fortunate to have these individuals contribute to our special issue. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of very quickly breeze through all six studies that were part of this special issue. And the whole point here is to kind of give you ideas, recommendations, suggestions on what you could possibly do with your own students. You might say, I might be working in a Chinese context or in a Filipino context or a Philippine context or a Thai context. And that's perfectly fine, right? But these are just examples for you to think about. Perhaps you can modify some of these activities and, and kind of uh, rework them to suit your own local teaching contexts. Okay, so that's the perspective I want you to take in, in that respect. Otherwise, you'd be saying like, I'm not in Mexico. This example has no relevance to me whatsoever in, in that sense. Uh, and of course, the, the special issue ends with the two commentaries uh, by a young scholar, Kate Seltzer, and, and, uh, and of course, a veteran scholar. And some of you probably know the work of Jim Cummins. The overarching idea here is decoloniality. 
And remember I mentioned this, I'll show you the slide earlier. Um, and, and I think M5 is going to be part of that panel later this year on translanguaging. I think with Pam on a several occasions, um, including a special issue of the General Language Identity and Education in 2021. So Alec and colleagues talk about decolonizing multilingual education uh, entails using community epistemologies and languaging practices built on particular histories, cultures, and places. What does that mean, right? The main idea here is, why are we using models of instruction that are in or outside our society? Why aren't we building from the bottom up pedagogies uh, that build on the these things, right? The different types of knowledge, community epistemologies, and the language practices of our students in that respect. Okay, but it's the second part that I kind of completely agree with because they go on to say that there are no fixed sets of rules. Yes, to some extent that there there aren't any, you know, uh, there isn't a set can fix set of rules, but at the same time, there are no rules. How do we move forward? <laughs> Where do we go from there, right? It's all abstract. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to offer you six guiding uh, ideas in that sense, in terms of how do we kind of decolonize pedagogy in that sense. Okay, so I, I'm going to link these six strategies with the examples from the special issue. Okay, uh, so one of the things you're going to think about is how do we raise reciprocal multilingual awareness? So we start with an, an, an example from uh, Brazil primarily, and, and the second part of the article actually draws an example in Australia, but I won't be talking about Australia today, uh, by Joel Windle and colleagues. So in their study, they worked with pre-service teachers in Brazil. And if you know Brazil, it's a very big country. It's very diverse. Uh, it's also a former Portuguese colony, right? So the ethnic composition in Brazil is really very, very vast in that sense. Um, but the idea of reciprocal here means that while we teach our students, we can also learn a lot from our students. It's a two-way street, right? It's bi-directional. And the students can also learn from each other, right? It's not only the teacher uh, doing all the instruction. It's not what Paulo Freire talked about, the banking method, right? Your job as a teacher is to just equip your students with knowledge because what you need to be doing is to be building on the knowledge that they already have in that sense. And at the same time, uh, to be learning from the students as well. So what Wendell did was he had a course um, that looked at English as a lingua franca. And they focused on intercultural communication. Um, and one of the things that he wanted the students to do was to think about linguistic variation and the social value of different accents. And okay, so he was interested in developing the reflection processes of these students. So Len is one of the pre-service teachers in the course. And he came to ask this question, who stand up? Right, uh, and he says it is no surprise that a Brazilian English uh, accent and its variation variations exist. But he goes on to say that speakers should not be forced to follow almost imperialist standards on how the pronunciation of a foreign language is supposed to be. Another piece of his teacher Anna said that uh, the course on English as a lingua franca did help her deconstruct the idea that good English is only the American one. Remember, the US is north of Brazil. And so the model that is probably used or emulated is not a British model, certainly not an Australian model, but an American model, right, in that sense. And so uh, there's something that's, that's eye-opening for Anna to say this. And then she goes on to say something that's equally eye-opening, and she says that the most valued accents are those of the cities of Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, which are the two biggest cities in Brazil, okay? The other modalities, mainly from the north of Brazil, in the interior, you know, usually most of the cities tend to be coastal in a way, 
uh, are often linked to a lack of intelligence in school education. So if you speak funny, so-called funny, your accent is different, the impression that's created is that you must be quite slow intellectually, <laughs> which is not true, right? And this is true, for example, in the US, if you come from the South and you speak with a Southern drawl, then they, by virtue of your accent, people already size you up mentally and say, hmm, maybe he's a little slow. You know, and that's a very wrong position to take, right? To, to evaluate someone just on uh, the way they speak. So here's a guiding question. If we were to try this out in classroom, what kind of language should we teach? Why that variation? And one of the things we could do, of course, is invite students to critically reflect on the value of linguistic variation in order to promote linguistic belonging. Uh, another thing we could do is to have them examine discourses of decoloniality. Uh, this example comes from uh, Mexico, um, the work of my colleague Mario Lopez Gobar um, and his um, uh, affiliates here. So again, when I mentioned that Brazil is a former Portuguese colony, Spain colonized Mexico, you know, uh, for 500 years ago. And you can see that in the picture here, right? The indigenous people squatting, for example, and, 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 and the, the, uh, the Spanish colonizers on horseback here. So it's interesting that Lopez, Gopar, and colleagues, they worked with undergraduate student teachers in Mexico, and they had them think about how uh, they themselves are both products and agents of history. Um, this was an interesting, critical, uh, and innovative activity where the students were asked to do a memes essay reflection. And they, they were also uh, instructed to discuss how white norms of beauty circulate on social media. So if you see the person on the right in the image, right, that's how she actually appears. But with the application of the app, it was literally whitewashing being done. The app, you know, um, transforms her to look like the image that you see on the left, right, in that sense. And of course, in English language teaching, we're always talking also about issues surrounding racism in, in, in that respect. Um, one of the student teachers, Marisol, in her assignment uh, titled Our Stories of Shame, uh, she talks about how um, she, growing up, um, her brother and her father used to say that she was very dark. And even my dad said I was not his daughter because my brother and sister are like skin like him. And there's like no terrible thing to say, obviously, in that sense to your daughter, right? Uh, this also does makes you think about how, of course, through language instruction, we're also addressing issues such as uh, racism, among other things. Another student teacher, Martin, talks about when he is asked to examine linguistic practices, he says that you need to protect ourselves from discrimination. No, he speaks an indigenous language and that we have been denied of our roots, bring down uh, indigenous languages like Zapotec, right? And they made us think that these languages are useless. Again, this whole idea of subtractive bilingualism that I mentioned earlier. So what can we do? So uh, we could have our students think about what colonial practices are we participating in and, and in, to some extent, therefore, implicated. Um, and so the classroom practice here, of course, is to create safe spaces where students can think about and reflect on critical moments of linguistic discrimination that they might have personally encountered. Next thing I want to do is think about how exactly do we build community relationships. The, this next example comes from France, uh, from Letitia Mary and Andrea Susan Young. Now, so far, I've been giving you examples that kind of related to English. But as I mentioned earlier, a standard language ideology can exist in any country with any language. So if you take the example of France, the standard language ideology here is French only. Okay, and France has a lot of immigrants coming from Africa, uh, coming from Syria, and, and 
and you know the Mediterranean part of, uh, of the world, right? And so in their study, they did a project-based inquiry, um, and they were working with younger learners. Um, so, so they had their students, primary younger learners, like primary school age learners, make bilingual books and to develop musical resources. And the interesting thing about this was that the teachers collaborated with members of the of the students' family and community members as well. So this teacher, Colette, said that she was very excited to work with mothers who helped with translations into Albanian and Arabic. And these mothers were very excited because it allowed them the chance to think about how the mother tongue of their children could be retained in the family, right? And so Colette built a special relationship with the mothers. Um, guiding question three here is what languages are present in our community? And we should think about how do we develop the multilingual resources of our students and to do it with them. If we were to do a similar thing with your own students, well, one of the things you could do is to have them uh, carry out a multilingual storytelling project right, where they create and share stories in multilingual languages, multiple languages, um, perhaps a linguistic landscape uh, project where they go out into the community and they observe and analyze how different languages are being used in public spaces. Uh, it's for number four, developing teachers as multilingual listeners. So we now move to the U.S., okay, and I want to say a little bit about the U.S., so so I'm at Michigan State University, and if you're wondering where Michigan is, it's kind of like in around the red part. It's called the Midwest of the U.S., okay? It's the interior of, of the country. Um, it's been, for the most part, the last two centuries, uh, very white. Not a lot of the immigrants came from Scandinavia and Germany as well. Okay, so this is the situation. In the schools, we have multilingual, multicultural, multi-ethnic students, immigrant students, refugee students. But who are the teachers? The teachers tend to be white, monolingual females. <laughs> so you can see the disconnect here, right? Teachers are monolingual, students multilingual, and, and, and all that. And so, um, well, Pissard and Haidt did was that they worked with 39 monolingual pre service teachers. And this might seem new to some of you, but for some teachers in the US, they've never really learned another language. Okay. <laughs> and so they were asked to take part in 30 hours of language instruction. And, and what they did was they had to reflect on their language learning experience and how that experience might ultimately impact their own teaching. So one teacher, pre-service teacher, Michelle, said, my knowing a little French is often more impressive, right? Uh, in that sense. And it's interesting because in the, in the linguistic hierarchy, French is seen as being more prestigious, as to, as to say learning Swahili, right? And so Michelle had 30 hours of French learning, and she goes on to say it matches what languages you know. What is equally interesting is she goes on to say in America, the only one language that matters is standard American English. And she's, I mean, she's quite spot on in, in making this observation. Another teacher, Jennifer, says said that English language learners are often marginalized in schools. And then she goes on to add that I've come to understand the privilege that accompanies being proficient in the language of power. Now, if you're a teacher, from the dominant group and you speak the dominant language, you don't think about these things. It's normalized for you, right? You don't think about your privilege. But through this process, teachers like Jennifer and Michelle kind of realize how fortunate they are to be uh, white English speakers um, who generally use the standard uh, variety of English. And so this is something I'd like all of you to think about. What is the language of power in your school? Um, well, only two parts came out earlier. 
my former colleague in Singapore. He published this wonderful volume in 2015 entitled Unequal Englishes. Basically, that not all English varieties are equally valued, right? And there's another big amount to look at by Marilyn Martin Jones that looks at researching multilingualism. Writing question here How well can teachers relate to the experiences of diverse students? And perhaps what we want to do is to have students learn. What we want to have is have teachers learn other languages, kind of what. Uh, um, or sudden um, I did in their study. Uh, two more examples and then we'll wrap up. Um, the next guiding principle, promote multimodal investigation. This example comes from Hong Kong. Um, my colleague Ron Darwin, who's, who was in Hong Kong, but has now returned to Vancouver, Canada. And, and he worked with uh, Yue Chang here. And so they were so their study was um, conducted with university students in Hong Kong. These were communication English majors. And these students were asked to create a multimodal project about a Chinese word that does not have an English equivalent. In other words, they were asked to then engage in linguistic analysis uh, and to think about how um, rhetorically that, that English or that Chinese word was being used. So in keeping with what I mentioned earlier, there was a linguistic landscape dimension to the project. So this is a picture of an MTR or subway station in Hong Kong. And of course, you see different languages represented in this public space. But what is interesting is that, as I mentioned earlier, language is tied with culture. And so Vanessa, one of the undergraduate students, was asked to explore how cultural values impact translation. And, and so the which means literally no face in English, um, has been translated based on what she found um, on the right here, a movie clip, right, where Vanessa is explaining what was going on. She found that uh, it's been translated into humiliating, which uh, Vanessa then linked to Cantonese. Uh, but what's more important is that she was made to think about how language, again, is very much a social construction and that words may index very specific cultural uh, meanings. So thing, the thing we could do is have students think about how language communicates uh, social and, and cultural values. And then in terms of class, we practice, we could have students investigate and deconstruct culturally important non-English practices to see how, how in fact, um, things might translate or not necessarily translate um, into the, the first culture. Um, so if you are teaching English for academic purposes, right, what you might want to do is to have them think about an important uh, concept in the local culture. But that concept might not have a direct equivalent in English, all right? And then that kind of creates the opportunity for more discussions on intercultural communication. So I come to the sixth and final example, and, and I've left this for the end because it talks about how do we scaffold CMLA instruction in teacher education. This is my own study with Kun. Uh, we did this work with our former students, Christina Ponzio, Hima Rawal, Li He, and uh, Dong Ming Ju. Okay. Um, what was the context of our study? We worked with one pre-service teacher and one novice teacher educator. The context is a teacher preparation program, I'll say quite openly, at our, at our university. And the pre-service teacher was being trained uh, in the area of ESL, okay? Um, so Leslie is the pre-service, no, sorry. Leslie is the teacher educator. She was a third-year PhD student. And Erica was a fourth-year undergraduate student. She's the pre-service teacher, right? So Erica enrolled in an undergraduate pre-service course, working with Leslie, who was her teacher educator okay so we had two questions you will see that question two is almost a mirror image of question one 
Question one asked, how does a novice teacher educator like Leslie interpret power in her respective course? And how are power issues manifested in the coursework? Same question, we replace teacher, novice teacher educator with pre-service teacher. So data sources included interviews, course materials, and student and teacher feedback. So this is Leslie, right? As I mentioned earlier, Leslie is kind of representative for most teachers in the Midwest, white, female, monolingual, working with students who are on the right, multilingual, multicultural, multi-ethnic. Okay. And so what was interesting was Leslie came to this revelation that she wanted to do harm, not win. And she says, our students in the practicum, for instance, are white middle-class females, that many of them are monolingual, have never experienced any type of language learning. And so, yes, I think it's extremely important for us to prepare our students to do harm, not good. The students say are pre-service teachers, right? This is Leslie. And so this was the course that Leslie was the instructor of, right? It was a whole semester and was broken up into modules. It's a TESOL practicum course. Module of one asked them to focus on who are emergent bilinguals. Module two looked at how do we rethink language and power. Module three focused on language power, policy and power. And module four uh, examined equity and translanguaging. So this is like a 14 work week, one semester course, right? Chopped up into four modules. So Leslie, the instructor, working with Erica, the pre-service teacher, right? So this is what um, both of them went through. And here's an example of uh, where we had um, the, the student think about certain things, right? So one of the course assignments was, if you look at the bottom table, what is your family, community language, and cultural history? What language and culture does your family and community practice most than with whom? And how did the language and culture experience in your family change over time? So this is like thinking about language use in your own personal context. Um, this is Erica, and she says that she saw some limitations in a way in her own teaching. She said, sometimes I get nervous that because I'm monolingual in English, I won't be able to connect with all my students because I'm limited in my language ability. And she goes on to reflect and say, the class reading did show me that all teachers have the power to promote communication and bravery amongst all their students. And so what's the sixth guiding question here? Well, something you think about is how does challenging unjust power dynamics make us feel? Okay, and so one of the things we could do is to have teachers and students kind of document and they discuss their own emotional and social experiences and have them think about perhaps their linguistic privilege or their lack of linguistic privilege in, in, in that sense. What do I do in my own classroom? Right? So I've been talking about different examples in different contexts. So this is an example of an activity that I would use with my own students. I have them draw what we would call a language portrait. It's something you can do very easily. You give them a piece of paper and ask them to draw themselves and kind of say, oh, how would you, what, number one, identify the languages that you are familiar with and kind of represent that on your language portrait. So it's not uncommon, for example, where a student usually associates English, the L2, with the head, right? It's the, the rational language. But with the heart, that's where they connect their L1 because there's an emotional dimension to their first language. And then you see in this picture, um, this girl is standing on a globe, right? And she says, I want to learn new languages because my desire is to travel and see the world. So, you know, this is not a difficult activity. It's something that is very simple. And sometimes I've given it to my undergraduates, I've given it to my graduate students, and so, uh, most of them finish in five, 10 minutes, but some of them say, you know, could I have a bit more time? I'd like to go home and complete it. 
right? And now they want to beautify it. They don't want to just draw it. They want to uh, jazz it up a okay. bit. But then that does become, in many ways, um, like the first step. But think about what are the languages in your repertoire? And how do you associate? And what, what associations do, do does each of the languages you know, have for you in that sense? Another activity is to have them draw language ideology trees, right? Um, this is done by a student who uh, talks about... So in the U.S., there are what we call heritage language learners. So you might be Hispanic. So when people look at you, they think, oh, Spanish is your first language. But if you have first generation, second generation, you're probably more familiar than English than Spanish, right? So... So it's not uncommon for, for these uh, learners to say, I feel a lot of shame because people look at me and they expect me to be proficient in Spanish. But I'm not. And they get a lot of heat and pressure from their grandparents who are probably Spanish monolingual, right? And so there are different ideologies that exist in that respect. What are the tensions? And this is one good way to have students think about what are the ideological tensions that they might encounter in, in that sense. So, so I just want to wrap up by saying, you know, one of the things that you could have your students do is perhaps work on their own autobiographies where they narrate their experience since learning a second language in addition to their mother tongue. And to have them, for example, think about their experiences also if they also speak various dialects as well. So the summary or takeaway, I'm wrapping it up, sorry, it's about an hour. <laughs> um, to kind of bring you back to this model, I'm not going to talk about it again. It's there, okay? And these are the six kind of guiding questions that I put before you. And, and on the right, I've given you some examples on how to explore these guiding questions. But looking ahead, uh, kids also said that uh, what we need to do is be committed to making the domain of power more visible and disruptable in teacher education classrooms. We're making the idea of centering power. And uh, if you'd like to know more about that, you know, this is a book that I uh, edited with my colleague Oscar Hanustok, uh, titled The Sociopolitical Agenda for TESOL Teacher Education. And on that note, I want to say thank you very much. And I'd like to direct you to the second bullet, which is my academic.edu uh, page, because that's where all my publications can be found if you want to look them up. All right. Thank you very much. I know there's a lot of information to take in one hour. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. Perfect one hour timing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, um, we've, we were very grateful to have heard this really, really interesting talk. Um, we're now um, opening up for questions and comments. Um, if you're in the room, obviously, you know, use, use your uh, uh, natural gift of speech. Yeah. Um, if you're on Zoom, um, you can uh, write a comment or write a question in the chat, or you can, you can raise your hand and I will... Um, um, and I will unmute you if you want to ask a question. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I'll I'll ask the first one. Yeah. yeah. Since people are are probably still thinking and formulating their yeah. thoughts and typing. Yeah. Sure. And nice thing about people in this room is that you have these mics in front of you, right? Exactly. So when you turn yeah. once they're activated, people on Zoom can also hear your question. Exactly. Yes. Yeah? So yeah. Don't forget. Yeah. Don't forget. Yeah. Um, I wanted to to ask. I think. Um, it's 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 a really thought provoking idea or really thought provoking sort of change that's going on in applied linguistics now, right? Where mm -hmm. we're conceptualizing learners as more like critical observers of language, not just you know consumers of it and then reproducing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then also teachers as kind of guides in that process. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about the literature that there is. Um, how does it um, consider or what does it tell us about teachers, the willingness of in-service teachers to implement these kind of changes? Do we do we see resistance? Does, does Is the literature looking at how to address resistance, you know, how to win practitioners over 
what, what do we see in yeah literature? i mean one good example would be in translanguaging right because many of our teachers probably grew up with the idea that languages needed to be kept separate we do not want to contaminate the language you know if we are teaching english we only teach english we're not going to be using our l1 maybe our l1 might be spanish or thai right and our students are here to learn english um they're not here to learn more thai <laughs> okay in that sense so that's what I think teacher education is going up against, right? Because there are these ideological biases, you know, and, and to keep languages pure and separate. And so translanguaging has had, you know, its fair share of pushback as well. And I think that's what, where, of course, the, the teacher education uh, courses is going to be helpful to think about how uh, we might use translanguaging as a pedagogical resource, we're not saying that we don't want our students to speak English fluently. That's not the message here, right? The question should be, how exactly do we get them to that level? What strategies do we use in our classroom to attain that goal in that respect? Because if you're working with a student, let's say you and the new student, okay, give you an example of uh, an immigrant student from Guatemala who still has zero English, but you speak Spanish. And you suddenly have the power to make yourself understood and comprehended by the student. Would it be wrong for you to build the ability to communicate with the student because you only have an English-only policy? Right? Or are you going to let the student kind of like suffer? You know, and uh, it's, it's true. To be fair, also one of the arguments about translanguaging is that you can't have a teacher speaking 25 languages in a in a classroom in New York, for example, there's no way a teacher can be speaking, you know, more than two or three languages at a time, right? So the question is also not the teacher just being the one being able to speak the language, but then, of course, allowing resources available, like, for example, a, a bilingual dictionary to be used by the student in the classroom to be able to um, access the content or putting a more advanced learner of English who speaks the same first L1 as the learner and allowing them to communicate in, say, Spanish with one another because somehow, sometimes, the new student might not be able to follow what you're saying, right? So, so sometimes teachers get a little bit nervous and insecure, right? They hear this other strange foreign language being spoken in class and it's all part of classroom management, speak English only, okay? And I think that's where teachers need to learn how to give up a bit of control and, and return or share some of that control with the, their students because they can't be the only resource, right? I've given you an example of an electronic dictionary as being a resource, but there are also peer resources that are in the classroom. Remember going back again to what I've been saying about how do we center the lives of teachers and students in the classroom, right? To see the students L1 not in deficit terms, but to see the students L1 in more asset-based terms. And, and so you then need to create the infrastructure and the possibility in a classroom to, to make that happen in, in that sense. So, I mean, that's one example. There is resistance. No one's saying it's going to be easy. But, you know, usually it's the teachers who grew up as L2 speakers themselves. They tend to, those students in the U.S., bilingual educators, the strongest bilingual educators tend to have been um, language learners themselves. And they are generally very strong advocates of uh, uh, translanguaging, for example, because they've been there and they know how hard it was to have gone through that steep learning curve. And, and so they're certainly more empathetic uh, to that. Yeah. Brilliant. So yeah. if, we're, if we're teaching yeah. English in Southeast Asia, we've got to remind ourselves of how, when we were learning English. Maybe, yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so that's where the reflection part comes in, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, I gave you the examples just now. Think about what were your experiences like? What were some of the uh, examples of prejudice and exclusion that you might have encountered when you were learning a language? Yeah. 
Um, any question from the room? Yes, Ajahn Uma. I'm sorry. Uh, I kind of have like a thought thought. So, yeah, don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain the term evidence-based instruction? Okay. I think I came across like from your slide. Yeah. Explain a little bit. Yeah. So, so more fancy definition here. Yeah. Right? So basically what we had in this special issue was six empirical studies. We're not saying here's CMLA, do it, right? What we're doing here was with the, not we, six, the six individual sets of authors of each paper, they were showing how CMLA is done in their respective classrooms, right? Because obviously people turn to you and they say, yeah, that's a nice idea. It's a theory, but uh, how workable is it? So so let me give you an example of the, the example from France, right? Um, the creation of these bilingual books working with these young learners. Well, the teacher didn't do it herself. What she did was she kind of recruited the Albanian mother, for example, in order to co-construct and co-create these bilingual books. Because the teacher, the French teacher didn't know Albanian, you, you know, in that sense. And so so that's that's what evidence-based for us means, right? Uh, real experiences of 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 um, the the teachers and teacher educators. Yeah. And I think that's important right? because it's very hard to sell an idea if you don't have data. It's, that's the fundamental principle uh, behind research, right? If you don't have the evidence, if you don't have the data, it's very, uh, you can't forward a compelling or robust argument, right? It's then just a theory. And so one of the things I said again was as we move from language awareness to critical language awareness, we need to combine knowledge with practice. And so this is the practice that, that not I have done, but the practice that uh, the six sets of authors have done. They've shown how teachers themselves have been able to um, into practice um, the theory. And that's why we have this term called praxis, right? P-R-A-X-I-S. It's a combination of practice and theory. And the problem is, a lot of teacher education courses, I mean, I have to say to some extent, when I was being trained as a teacher almost three decades ago, I, I was thinking back, I wish I'd had more examples of how exactly to carry out. I remember learning about Piaget, for example, right? It's a classic thing we, we learn in teacher ed courses. <laughs> like, yeah, nice, and I can explain, I could recite to you what the theory was about, but what does that look like in the actual classroom? And what does that look like in everyday pedagogical practice instruction? Mm -hmm. Yes, please go ahead. Well, thank you for coming today and uh, being so generous with your bibliography, not just your own works, but all mm -hmm. the sort of important works in the field. I really appreciate on that. I'm really curious about your um in, in your insights into pedagogy <laughs> you already stated uh this idea of uh, allowing multiple language use in the classroom uh and that seems to me to be a, a, a teaching bias that comes from this group of as you say mostly white middle class um american teachers these <laughs> pedagogies of um language learning and uh the sort of communicative language style so you know it's based on these assumptions of about language learners that don't really um are not really relevant to us here mm. right our students are learning english probably as their third language if not their fourth our mm -hmm, teachers mm -hmm. are multilingual themselves mm -hmm. um so i'm curious about and in addition to this idea of insisting on english only in the english classroom i'm under, i'm interested in what other kinds of um habits or pedagogical strategies that we think are natural, you might uh, encourage us to to disregard mm -hmm. as ways, you know, in, instead of impeding our learners with these strategies, um, you know, how does this multimodal um, 
uh, concept that you're adding to to the communicative style? How does that multimodal style, you know, suggest that some of these practices mm -hmm. are outdated, and how mm -hmm. can we better help our students to learn? Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. So let's take ALM for example, audiolingual uh, method, right? Um, and going back to your point about multimodality, is our goal basically to have them listen to a recording and then rehearse, 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 repeat, repeat, repeat. Unless there is no value in that, all right? Again, I don't want to diss all the, the pedagogical value of these other approaches, but I like to take a, a, a fast approach. You know, how do we supplement, how do we complement with some of our previous pedagogical practices? Just like, I think some level of drills it's not right? in, in that sense. Don't, don't throw a baby out of the bath water, I guess. That's my perspective. Then, so if, if we say, for example, and not just receptive learning, you know, how do we actually produce? So production could, all, of course, be just repeating what you just heard on the recording in one of the you know, old school labs, you know, listening labs. But then production could be, well, why don't you mix something? Why don't you make a YouTube video, right? Our students are so digitally advanced, you know? It's the production part that's important because the fact is that's what they're going to be using language for in real life. You know, it's like a lot of the CLT stuff is like, yeah, we it is task-based. Let's simulate an example of ordering a meal at a restaurant. Let's practice English again. Okay? You know, some of us will get to do that, especially if you get to travel abroad. You'll you'll use the English. But I think the majority of the English learners in the greater part of Asia will probably never get to do that. Or there's no need to do that. Okay. Um and so but on the other hand, they might be able to create a multimodal, multilingual um uh, uh video that they put on say um Instagram like example because that's how they're communicating these days all right in 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 that sense um so keeping it real is important maybe taking a step back and saying how is language used today and then by backward design if that's how it's being used, then how do I get them from here to there? And then I think that's going to be able to create a lot more buy-in to the... And it's going to take away less pressure and expectation on you as a teacher. So now you're building the instruction, you're co-building it with your students in, in, in that. It's going to be more exciting for them. It's going to be a little less pressurizing for you too that you have to come in with all these materials today and deliver those materials in, in that sense, right? So, so I think the multimodality part is, is certainly important. Um, but as I said, think about how you want them to use language, but also maybe ask them how they would like to use the language. I mean, it sounds like a very old school needs analysis approach that has a lot of value in asking them how do they envision uh, themselves using otherwise there's going to be a little buy-in i mean christoph and i was saying like some people have been doing the same thing for then 10 years doing tenses over and over and over again and not seeing much value in in such exercises right in that sense so and um so i i would start with that basically ask yourself what am i doing now what can I do better? And, and so it's not a project, let's throw everything I've been doing in the last 10 years and replace it with something absolutely new. I guess the other point I want to make is it might seem really daunting to do it all by yourself. And that's where I think having colleagues at your work setting is going to be helpful. You don't have to come up with a solution all by yourself, right? And one of the best things as a teacher I've always encountered is to have working groups um, lesson sharing and things like that because to create a new set of resources all by yourself can be very daunting especially if you have to create resources for an entire semester from scratch 
So why not kind of call up the work, working teams and then rebuild the curriculum together in, in that sense, in consultation with your students in, in that respect? I mean, look at my words. I'm not saying, I'm not saying all models from the West are bad. You know, you can choose your all language teaching professionals, but you are the ones who know your students best, not the author of the Cambridge University textbook. Writing from way on the other side of the world, okay? How about using examples from local culture? You can still use those local examples and still teach English, right? So, so, so. I think that would then I think itself also energize your students and, and draw them in because if you're using examples that they just simply cannot relate to, that makes the learning process even less enticing and even more challenging in, in that sense. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um yeah, so it's enhancing authenticity and yeah. considering how being multilingual is an authentic condition. Right. And an asset for sure. Asset. Right. Yeah. Um on Zoom, I, I, I'm hoping that um you're still with us. Um, we still got 60 people. We want to hear from you. Yeah. So if you want to ask a question, yeah, just you know, use the raise hand reaction. Um uh, where is it? Here we go. Yeah. Raise hand. We're we're very happy to hear from you. Um We've got a couple of positive comments sure. in the chat. I'm going to stop sharing so that that way I might be able to see who these people are. Yeah, yeah. Um, do we have any other? Oh. I'm oh. just raising my hand okay. just to show the example. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Do you have any suggestion for those who are interested in this area and would like to do research, like for new researchers or you know experienced teachers, but have some idea and uh, want to participate or research in uh, the area of uh, C CMLA? Right. Yeah. So I guess I would start with doing research in your own classroom. So I don't know what the courses are like here in your uh, master's program. But I assume that you have some methodology classes. And so perhaps the methodology to start with might be action research, where you start uh, looking at your own practices. Because it's always easiest to look at your own practices. And and all, all, all you know, it's called teacher research, it's called action research, it's called practitioner research. I'd like to go back again by saying it doesn't have to be you only studying your own practice. If the three of you can come together and be an action research team, let's say that this is a lesson that you each of you has one class, and you have to teach the lesson in your three respective classes, right? So one of the things could be, I'm just, this is not a lesson study research. Um, so let's say that this lesson is not Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and there's three of you. So maybe on Monday, teacher number one teaches and teachers two and three sit in on the lesson and observe her teach it. And then after that lesson is over, the three of you reconvene and talk about how did that lesson go? What, was, what went well and what can we improve or work on? And then you kind of maybe you refine your lesson plan. On Tuesday, teacher number two teaches it, but teachers one and three are now observing. And then you repeat that pattern again you have a post-lesson conference among yourselves. There's no external person, right? It's just a high level of trust and comfort among the three of you. And then you do it a third time. And one assumes that between Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, by the time we get to the Wednesday class, that lesson will probably be much better shaped than it was on Monday. So, you know, pick something that, you know, that might be CMLA related. And that's what I would do, not a task, but you know, one of those tasks, for example, that I talked about, put it into practice and then see how it plays out in your own classroom. And then, you know, then you know, if, if, if you want to get it published, you know, I would maybe start first by perhaps presenting your findings at a local conference, getting feedback, you know, getting more people interested in what you're doing, perhaps. And 
I mean, I'm a firm believer of creating communities of practice. So you can create your own community of practice here at Prince uh, of Songkhla University, but then you can also hook up with other colleagues at different universities, maybe regional universities. And, you know, you know, start the ball rolling there and maybe form um, um, like a research network or something like that. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not, I know Thai Tea Soil exists, for example, right? Or comparable professional organizations that you can plug yourself into. So I think, it, you know, research can be very lonely, but if you find the right research partners, the research can be very, very stimulating and most importantly, very rewarding, especially if your goal is to use your research findings to improve your own instruction or teaching. If that's, and I'm, so it doesn't have to be this big research design involving 1,500 participants, which most teachers are not going to be doing anyway, right? Uh, or some experimental research which, which requires very fancy equipment, like we talked about eye tracking uh, last night. Not everyone has access to a $50,000 eye tracker, <laughs> okay? It can be research that starts from your own classroom, and then you build up uh, with and through your different communities of practice in that sense. And, you know, for some of you, the goal might not be to publish in some major journal, but it could be, you know, I always tell my students, you need to be able to speak to multiple audiences, and sometimes the publication could be in a teacher newsletter, and that, that publication probably is going to be more widely read than an article that comes out in some prestigious journal that maybe, you know, a handful of people will read. So you need to ask yourself, right, research for what purpose in, in, in that respect, and um, what are the audiences I, I'm targeting uh, as a result of my research? You know, so it might be a wonderful conference presentation and ends there. There doesn't need to be a publication component to it. You know, going back to multimodality, you might then create that presentation and, you know, put it on YouTube and have that circulate so that other people can see you talk about your research. So unless there is a lot of pressure to publish, that's a different story, right? But But if you are interested in research for its own um, purpose, you know, there are many ways for us to be researchers and to do research in that sense. Mm. Okay. okay, we do have now a question on Zoom. We have, okay. we have Vanessa. Um, Vanessa, you can, you can go ahead, unmute yourself and um, share your idea, ask your question. Um, hello, uh, good afternoon or good morning to everyone. Hello, Professor. Uh, I hope that you can hear me from there. Sorry, Vanessa, just a second. We can't hear you. Just a sec. Oh, is our tech guy here? Yes. Um, can you hear me now, Paul? Well, no, I think it's our problem. Oh, really? Okay. So, can you try again? Okay, so um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. So I'm Vanessa Alberto from the Philippines. Uh, I'm very much interested with translanguaging. Um, Professor, mm -hmm. can you share uh, classroom strategies that you used or developed as basis for adopting or creating translanguaging practices? Yeah. No, that's a great question, right, in, in, in that sense. So... Um... So, for example, imagine if you have a group of 40 students, that's a big class, <laughs> and that maybe the way that the furniture in your room can be rearranged. So maybe you have 40 students, but you break them up into eight groups or five, right? Mm -hmm. And you assign each of the eight groups a task. Yeah, whatever task you want them to do, right? In that sense. And then you know that you have mixed ability students in the class. 
And so you use that to your advantage. You would then, in your group of five, have perhaps one or two more advanced learners and with three newer learners, right, in that sense. And then you could say, well, um, if the task is maybe to produce um, a short piece of writing, maybe an advertisement in, I hate to use the word, but target language in English, okay, in that sense. Or you could say, um, only in an advertisement um, in your L1 to the classroom, okay? And then with your four other group members, let's create a translation of that advertisement in English. Okay, so oh, going back to what I said earlier, peers can be resources, but then there are also resources such as electronic, online, digital resources. And so you say, we give you 40, 45 minutes, work on this translation exercise, okay? Uh, try it together. Don't just do it individually. Or don't let one person do everything. Then it defeats the purpose in that sense. So, so that may be a, a, a little task that you could do, right? Making sure that the students are able to use whatever resources they have around them, okay? I think this language you could also work when... Because remember one of the things I said earlier was that generally concerning issues of power and exclusion, right? Many of these new learners, what we call minoritized learners, they are invisible in the class. They're silent in the class. And so the teacher kind of like looks past them, you know? So one of the things we talk about identity research is like how do we create opportunities so that these learners can speak from positions of power, which is a very fancy way of saying, you know, or maybe let ask them to talk about one aspect of their culture tomorrow. They can pick anything that they're comfortable with. You can say, bring one cultural artifact from your home and talk about it. Explain to us why this cultural artifact is important to your community. Okay. And then let them say, well, you can talk about it in your L1. No problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then after that, say, now in a group, I need the peers to mm -hmm. offer a translation of what she just said in her L1. So number one, you're kind of validating the identity of your minoritized learner. So, and everyone's learning in the classroom too, because she brings in a cultural artifact from the home. So maybe it could be something like um, an example of a food that's eaten in the community, right? She brings it, she talks about it, and she, so she explains, this food is a very important staple in my culture. And then she talks about it extensively in her L1, right? So people in the classroom now learn one new thing about this person's culture, okay? Everyone is like one way, right? Everybody wins. It's, so it's not like something that's neat, that's old. It's, it's a new thing. The student benefits by having this wonderful opportunity to showcase her knowledge. She's proud about her culture. So that's the issue of pride, the emotion, right, associated with it. She's given the opportunity to use her L1, which is not, again, a strictive bilingual approach. You're taking an additive approach. And then you're saying, we're going to build on this. Now let's facilitate this opportunity for, for her to make her message intelligible and understood by the other people in the classroom. And we're going to do it by um, asking peers to help her, by allowing her to use these digital electronic resources. 
Now, it's going to take time, obviously. It's probably going to take up an entire lesson in that respect. But it has a real-world function. Do you know what I'm saying? It's coming from the student. It's not coming from you, the teacher, right? And you might say there are other students in the classroom too who might come from the same culture in L1, and they're going to feel excited about it because they might be able to add information to that cultural artifact and say how that artifact is important to their own families in, in that sense. So it's not your typical textbook activity that you pull out. Today we'll do lesson 10 on page 25 of our textbook, but it's something that you're building bottom up with the students. And I'm not saying every lesson has to be like that, right? So I would use a combination of examples from a textbook. But, you know, if every day you come to class and you do another task from the class, from the textbook, you become predictable and students get really, really bored. So you want to do is kind of mix things up a little bit in, in that sense. So but, uh, there is an excellent book um, by Ophelia Garcia and, and Kate Seltzer about the tense language in classroom. It was published in 2015, 2016. It's excellent because it has more examples. Teachers, um, not just in New York City, but also from Chicago and Los Angeles. And the reason why they use these three cities is because these three major US cities have very big multilingual populations. So what when you read the book, um, they are told in terms of personal anecdotes of teachers. So it's not like you're reading this um, article with a, with a lot of academic jargon, right? It's told in a very reader-friendly way in, in, in that sense. And I use it to my own teacher education classes uh, with not pre-service teachers. I use it with in-service teachers. So teachers are already teaching in classrooms. And then way they read it, they also learn a lot uh, from the examples and experiences that our Garcia colleagues talk about. Yeah. So thanks, Vanessa, for that question. Thank you for the question, okay. Vanessa. <clears throat> Um, any any final questions from Zoom? Okay. okay. I think then um, we will uh, extend a final thank you to Peter yeah. um, for for um, joining us today and for giving us a really so generous with his time. Yeah. yeah. Um, we we um, like to invite you to come back tomorrow. We've got another event tomorrow, which is maybe geared a little bit more toward academics. Yeah, about um, publishing. Yes, it's about how to publish your work from the perspective of editor, author, and reviewer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, which are three perspectives in one in Peter. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and this is this is if you are working in a university, um, something that these days, of course, everyone really, uh, really knows that we've got mm -hmm. to be concerned about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, do join us tomorrow, same time, um, and um, please do, please do um, join us again. And thank you very much for coming um, virtually to Prince of Santa University. Yes, yeah? thank you. And I, I hope to see some of you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Okay. All right. I'm going to turn off my... <laughs>